I'm hoping to come up and be in person at some point in the future. Um, so this, this is probably the third, the third individual job that I had in Alaska. I've worked in the Bering Sea in an island called St. Lawrence Island doing bird flu monitoring and seabird uh, productivity and population monitoring there. In fact, Bill Maslach, who just introduced me, came out for one of those stints. I've worked in Prince William Sound on post Exxon Valdez seabird monitoring and Pigou, uh, Pigeon Guillemot restoration and parakeet auklet restoration um, as a result of the Exxon uh, Valdez oil spill. And I've done that for a number of years. And then I've worked at Cape Pierce on the Togiak National Wildlife Refuge for three summers. I would love to get back to this place, but it seems as though the funding is continuing to dwindle and uh, they just haven't had anyone out there the last couple of years, which is, which is really too bad because this is long-term trend data. So it's really important to keep it going. Um, let's see how I advance. There you go. So I've broken up this talk into four main parts. I'm going to give you a really brief introduction to Togiak National Wildlife Refuge. Um, I'll give you a little introduction to Kate Pierce, kind of what, what it's like right when you arrive and kind of setting up the plots um, with the ropes and kind of showing you a little bit of the landscape and scenery. And then I'll kind of dive into our seabird population and productivity project. And then we'll end with just some kind of epic wildlife and, and plant photos for you. So these are the National Wildlife Refugee, Refuges sorry, in Alaska. You can see everything that's not a bright yellow color is a US Fish and Wildlife Service National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, so you can see that there's a lot of refuge land and I'm hoping you can see my cursor. Maybe someone shout out if you can see it. This we little blue. You can see it. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this little blue blob right here is the Togiak National Wildlife Refuge. So just to help you get your bearings, over here is Prince William Sound. Uh, this would be Anchorage, Alaska and the Kenai Peninsula, obviously Kodiak Island, um, the Alaska Peninsula. So all the Aleutians. And this is Bristol Bay here. You maybe have heard of Bristol Bay. It's a very large fishery. Um, the Pebble Mine has been a very controversial mine that's trying to get permitted to go in that's located over here and could potentially affect um, a lot of the, the fisheries uh, in the Bristol Bay area. This is the Good News Mine. You might have heard of Good News Mine and Good News Bay over here. So just some little bearings. This is uh, St. Lawrence Island, one of the places that I've worked in Alaska as well in the Bering Sea. So for Togiak National Wildlife Refuge in particular, I wanted to just give you a Google Earth image so you could kind of see, again, this is Dillingham and Nushigak Bay on the Nushigak River. This is right outside of the refuge and it's uh, the place that we fly in and out of from Anchorage. So most of these fishing communities along this stretch of Alaska, I mean, there really aren't many. You have to fly in or boat in, uh, and most of them are actually in this area, really remote native villages. But there is a town called Dillingham here, and then there's another one called um, King Salmon over here, and they're really um, small villages, but they become very large fishing towns in the summer. Uh, these stars kind of indicate places you're going to see in my photos. So again, this lower star is Dillingham on the Nushigak River in Nushigak Bay. This is a tiny little village of Togiak, and you'll see a picture of it from a plane. This is Hagemeister Island. You'll see a picture of Hagemeister Island. And then this is Cape Pierce over here where I've done the monitoring. This little uh, airplane is a U.S. Um, Air Force base on Cape Newenham, which is just across the bay from where I was. All right, so on the Togiak National Wildlife Refuge, you can see in the background here, this is Dillingham. So it's a, it's a small little community. And again, everything has to get flown in or, or boated in and out. Uh, barges do come to this area and you can kind of see the airstrip over here. It's a very small community. Um, not many people at all in this community most of the year. And then as it gets towards summer, the town just blows up with all the, the fisher the fisheries industry folks. And these aren't just people that are on the boats, but they're people working in uh, the supply industry, the support services, such as um, housing accommodations and food services, cell services, um, the canning operation, et cetera. For the actual wildlife refuge staff um, in Dillingham, there's only 15 permanent staff and about 20 seasonals every summer. So 35 people are in charge of doing the heavy lifting of wildlife monitoring, water quality and fisheries monitoring, all the enforcement, education, and outreach 
on um, what is over 4.7 million acres. Uh, and so, you know, Bill and I both work for state parks here and we often talk about how we get enough money from the state government to manage 1% of our land in state parks. But this is 35 people and remember 20 of those people are seasonal on 4.7 million acres. So you have to have a really big picture approach like how are you going to get the most bang for your buck when it comes to management of this area. Uh, it's not a lot of staff to cover that many acres. 2.3 million of those acres in the northern section are all wilderness so they're completely protected where you can't really go in and out unless you're native or you have special permits. Um, and so it's very difficult to access. There's about 150,000 caribou and 15,000 moose that are known to be on the, this refuge. There's bears and wolves and marmots and beavers and fox and a bunch of other animals that I'm leaving off. It's one of the largest male walrus uh, haul outs in mainland Alaska. And so uh, it's mostly the male walrus that haul out um, where they actually leave the icy waters and they go on to an island or uh, the coastal part of the mainland to kind of uh, in, in large, large herds of walrus. And this is one of the largest ones uh, in mainland North America. There's about 250 bird species. So there's over a million seabirds that nest along the coast and there's huge eelgrass beds for the Brant's geese. Really important eelgrass habitat on this refuge. Um, this background photo is showing you one of those remote little native villages. So this was on the plane flight from Dillingham to uh, a village called Togiak which was kind of a way station. We were there for a little more than 24 hours as we were fueling up the plane and um, we we're having to kind of fly people in shifts. I'll, I'll explain a little bit about that later. And this was a small village that we flew over. So again, everything has to be flown in and out, which means they have to burn all their refuse out there. Um, and you know, they do a lot of subsistence hunting and fishing because there's just not a lot of supply chain around, as you can see. And anything that they fly in is incredibly expensive to these villages. You know, a small can of tuna might cost $8. Um, a little package of cream cheese, again, might be about $8. So very expensive because they're flying everything in. So as far as land use goes, there's tribal land for subsistence hunting and fishing. There's some tourism in the non-wilderness areas. Uh, the most common tourism is a river float trip where you get flown in and dropped off upstream and you float down and you're picked up somewhere else later by your tour guides. There's about 1500 miles of river and stream habitat where this is allowed and there's some wildlife viewing allowed. So either through these float trips or through plane flights. But that's pretty limited and it's uh, very seasonal, seasonally specific. Another big thing that happens on the wildlife refuge, as I mentioned before, is the salmon fishery. So again, in Bristol Bay. Um, and as far as resource extraction, those are the two right here, what we're seeing, the good news mines and mining and fishing. Those are the two big kind of uh, industries for resource extraction that affect the Togiak National Wildlife Refuge. Incidentally, this background photo is Dillingham as all the boats are kind of getting, getting ready for the season, the summer season. All right, so now we're going to get into part two, which is really arrival at Cape Pearson setup. Now I went there three summers, um, three out of four consecutive summers. And uh, the first time we went out, we went out with the man who hired us. And when he was much younger, maybe 15 years or so before I went out, he was a seasonal there and he spent nine months out at this cabin with his um, then girlfriend, soon to be wife. And actually they decided to get married when they were out here on their nine month stint. And so, um, you know, this project has now shrunken down to a three month project and then subsequently a one and a half month project. And so when you're shrinking a, a project like this down, it means you're losing a lot of that trend data. And so um, there's a lot less plots monitored now than were ever monitored before. So anyways, our, our initial arrival, we were there with our boss and we were uh, setting up the camp, which is this cabin you can see here. And then all of the observation points for monitoring the plots where we have seabirds require anchors and ropes to be installed. So I'll show you what that looks like. Um, this was our departure from Dillingham. We had to leave in a small plane called the Cub, our, the float plane the first year 
uh, was out of commission and it was it was being repaired and so normally a float plane could fit a pilot and two passengers and a bunch of gear this plane is a fraction of the size uh, and it could only fit the pilot and one person so this is me and just a small handful of gear so he had to take he had to shuttle three of us out there and then all of our gear for the three months so it took him about six trips to get everything out there and needless to say the pilot was a little bit grumpy with that but there was nothing to be done because the float plane was down. So we were doing beach landings. This was kind of departing, departing Dillingham uh, for Togiak to fuel up and then head out to Cape Pierce. This is what it looks like when you're flying over from Dillingham out to uh, the, the small remote uh, native village called Togiak. You can see extensive riverine systems. You can see that they're pretty cloudy from all the glacial silt and sediment. Lots of oxbows. I mean, it's really fascinating if you're into hydrology or geology at all. Uh, just some more views. You can see we have to stay fairly low because we're in this very small plane, but it's just this epic landscape. This is the small uh, community of Togiak, and again, planes go in and out. Uh, mostly it's boats here. So this is the, the kind of totality of the, the fishing, uh, native fishing community called Togiak. That's an inholding on the refuge. This is Hagermeister Island. I kind of pointed that out to you on a map. So now we've left Togiak and we're flying along the coastline out to the Cape. And this is, uh, I didn't have any really good pictures. It was so difficult to take pictures out of that tiny little plane. Uh, but this is a Google Earth image looking down on the Cape. And this is where our little tiny plane lands. We have to offhaul all of our gear here. And then we have to hike our gear all the way past this pond into the cabin here. So it's about, a mile and a quarter and we're carrying everything from propane tanks to solar uh, batteries for our solar power um, all of our groceries that we have for the next three months um, all of our personal gear and our, our work equipment and our shotguns so it's a lot to haul uh, so this first year when we were doing multiple trips out there on that small plane it was actually easier for us because we could do a few loads and wait for the next plane to arrive. When we arrive in the float plane, it's, it's most of our stuff all at once. And it becomes kind of overwhelming to make sure you get everything off the beach in a timely manner before bears find your food. So this is what it looks like when that plane lands on the beach. Uh, this is my boss. Uh, his name is Mike Swaim, and he's meeting myself and the pilot. Um, my other work partner hadn't arrived yet. His name was Mike, and he was the next load that was going to get delivered to the beach. Um, this is what it looks like when they offload your gear and fly away, and then you have to make all of this gear get to, uh, you know, a mile and a quarter, mile and a half to that cabin. We had some sleds you could pull, but really it was just uh, putting on backpacks or frame packs and carrying as much as you could. And this was only a, a portion of the gear that we had. All right, so this is what it looks like as you approach the cabin. Uh, it's a lot of sand dunes, a lot of freshwater marsh habitat. The slope up here behind the sand dunes is uh, mostly uh, soapstone substrate, and uh, it gets really steep really fast. You can kind of see it almost forms a wall behind the cabin. So it's really protected from the elements. It's fairly protected from flooding. I mean, there is a tidal connection here. These are all kind of tidal creeks as well as freshwater seeping down, um, but, but really lovely and fairly protected. A little closer view of the cabin and uh, this is it, we, we arrived. This is what it looks like inside. I don't know how many of you have been to remote locations, so I think this kind of stuff is worth showing. I always get curious about what a camp's gonna look like. Um, the refrigerator and this heater are both uh, propane based and so you have to really uh, you have to kind of eat all your fresh and frozen food first because there's no way to take enough propane out there to last you for three months and you're really more concerned about having propane for heating than you are for food and so what's out of view is that there's a bunch of canned food and, and some dried goods stored as well. Um, so that's the kitchen and from the kitchen that's the office. And um, there's two teeny tiny little bunk rooms. Uh, you can maybe see one off to the side over here. And then this is where we store all of our gear and our ropes uh, for accessing our plots. So it's very tiny. We were here, uh, the three of us together for a little more than 10 days initially. And uh, you know, we spend most of our time outside and everyone got along well, so it wasn't really a big deal, but definitely small, small quarters. This is what it looks like right out front of the cabin in the morning. It's a lovely view. 
can see this pond. And again, this is the hike that we would take out to the beach. All right, so our first day was kind of getting the lay of the land and learning where all the observation points were and setting up all of our ropes and anchors. You can see on the picture on the right here that it's very steep terrain. We're always on, on one section of a slope looking across the cove to our plots. It's really important to minimize disturbance to the plots and have a good view. Uh, and the observation points were, were initiated over 20 years ago, so it's really important to sit in the exact same location. Only a couple of the points had fallen into the sea, so we had to reestablish those, and that's not a super common thing out there. Uh, and we made new anchors and, and got our ropes set up for the year. Now, this is about an eight-mile hike that we have to go on along the bluffs to hit all the plots, and so we're carrying the ropes this, this whole distance. It takes a couple days to do this. Um, this is what it looks like carrying one of those ropes for many miles. Uh, they kind of come a little unbound and this was us finally offloading to set up one of our longer rope systems um, uh, on a very steep cliff. Just some of the nice views you can see uh, here's the cabin and this is looking across the the bay. This is the slug river that opens up into this bay, a large sand spit and uh, Cape Newingham on the other side. So this was a nice clear day when we were doing our ropes. Just some more views for you as we were getting the lay of the land. So one thing I want to point out is we might be perched here for an observation point looking this way towards a plot or looking across this way towards a plot. Uh, we never climb down the ropes onto cliffs. We don't want to disturb those colonies. So we try to get a vantage point uh, where we can see the plots clearly and not disturb any of the wildlife. And just some other epic views from our rope setting locations that I thought you guys might enjoy. So this is the Cape itself and we passed across the Cape to the other side. It was a lot more stormy. The winds were really coming in and what we noticed we had four plots in here and apparently since the year before all of those plots had gone through some sort of cliff or rock slide of, of event and so none of the plots were there. So just because of the topographic changes in this harsh environment our plot size was already reduced but it was about an eight mile hike out to this point. All right, so that was just a little bit of what it takes to set it up. I'm going to get into what we actually do when we're out there studying the birds. So we are looking at pelagic cormorants, black-legged kittiwakes, common murres, and very rarely thick-billed murres. Now, a lot of the plots that had fallen into the cliffs or that were over at Cape Newenham and abandoned as there was budget constraints had thick-billed murres on them. Uh, there was very few thick-billed murres left by the time I, I got onto this project. So we're looking at population and productivity data. Basically, we're counting numbers and we're counting nests and what's in those nests and what's the fate of those nests. So if the, the eggs actually hatch and the chicks actually fledge. This is a 20 year data set at the time when I started. So it's been 24, 25 years now. Um, and the idea of, a, of trend data over such a long period of time is to determine population trends. There's a lot of fluctuations that happen for seabirds with um, weather events and, and ocean currents and upwelling. And so there's definitely some boom and bust, but they're looking at long-term data in particular as it relates to prey base and, and climate change. Seabirds are really good indicators for this, for ocean health and climate change, because they are so connected to the food resources that the ocean provides, in particular, the small fish and the krill. So I've worked on, you know, auklet projects, I've worked on pigeon guillemot projects, and, and this project where we're looking at kitty wakes and um, cormorants and mers, and they are all completely tied to those upwelling events and the prey supply. And we know with uh, climate change, we're seeing a lot of changes to those um, prey base because of uh, increased ocean temperatures. So a lot of this data can help them determine management strategies and also feed into this larger collective pool of scientists that are looking at climate change issues. All right, so our basic protocol, you can see me sitting here on the lower right, and I have the last year's plot map in front of me for whatever that observation point is. The first thing that you have to do is mat, like make sure that you have the exact same vantage point 
as all the years before. You want to be uh, looking at these rocks at the same angle. If you're a slightly different angle, you might be missing nests or you might be adding nests. And it's really important to keep this as consistent as possible between years. And so we take new photographs of the plots from the same vantage point, and that can account for any uh, small topographic changes that have happened on that cliff face where the plot is located, and just make sure that it's up to date. And those are ortho rectified photos that we put into a, a mapping app, a arc map, and, um, and everything is basically geo referenced that way. We do population counts for all the species. So we're counting the adult birds, the eggs, and the chicks and juveniles, and we're counting total nest numbers for each plot. Now we had 10 plots, but our plot 10 had 10 subplots. So there was really 20 plots that we were looking at. Um, and this is a, a lot of counting to do every, every couple days. We also do nest monitoring. So we find up to 50 nests per species. Um, we actually usually have more than 50 nests per species if they're available. And we look at the, um, for each nest that we identify and map, we look at adult bird activity and the nest contents and we try to track that through the breeding season. And then we alternate this. So we would do a couple days worth of population counts. It would take us two days to get through all 20 plots. And then on the third day, we would do nest monitoring and then we would just repeat again. And we never really took days off because we knew that there would be a bad weather day, a, a day that was just too rainy and we wouldn't be able to see through our binos or our spotting scope. And so you just kind of work until you get a bad weather day. Um, so we just kind of kept on that cycle um, until, yeah, until it rained really hard and we had finally had a day off. So here's a look at a breeding pair of pelagic cormorants on a nest. Now, clearly they're not incubating an egg, so they hadn't laid any eggs yet. Um, their behavior really changes once they have eggs in the nest. This, I put this in instead of a common mer picture because mostly you're going to see common mers from here on out. And this was one of the rare thick build mers that we had. And you can see that it's really uh, dark black here as opposed to kind of that dark brown that you see on a common mer. And it has a shorter bill on this nice white line along the edge of the bill as well. Kind of distinguish it from a common mer. And then black legged kittiwakes. So those are the, the three main or four main species that we were looking at. So here's a little colony of common murs. You can see that it's a little bit more brownish and you don't see that distinguishing white line and their bill actually looks a little bit longer and skinnier. Again, we mostly had common murs out at this site. So our population counts would start by taking a plot. Now this happened to be one of our smallest and simplest plots. It was very easy to observe it. It was very small and contained. I mean, there's a lot of activity going on there, but it only takes you a day or two to be able to count the birds and describe what they're doing. You're looking for specific postures. If a bird is just standing like this, it's not incubating anything. But as you get closer where you see birds that are kind of more laid down, you have to start to ask yourself if they could be on eggs. And I'll show you some of that incubating posture in later pictures. So you'd start with your mapped out um, colony or your plot, and you just count what you see. And so here we would just be accounting a counting adult birds and indicating if we're starting to see any signs of incubation or if we see any eggs as the birds move around. It gets a little harder for a plot like this. So this whole thing is our plot 10. This would take two people an entire day to count and it's divided up into subplots. And remember, we're, we're looking at this from a, you know, a, the other side of the cove. And so it gets really uh, tedious to do and your eyes get very tired and um, there's a lot of things that can happen that make you have to start your count over. Um, again, you can see me here on ropes. I'm looking at my plot map. Uh, my spotting scope is out of view, but I do have a spotting scope and binoculars and I'm constantly checking my plot map and making sure I'm counting in the right location. So one thing that helps us do this on these large colonies is to break the plots up into subplots. Now someone did this, you know, 20 years before my time and they use topographic features like maybe the slight change in slope aspect on the cliff to determine a subplot. So here are just four uh, subplots that are kind of called out. I'm gonna kind of zoom in on this little ledge here. Um, and you can see a zoom in on this little, this little buttress on this ledge is right here. 
And so once you get your spotting scope on it, you can see a lot more detail. Now, again, we're counting every single bird of each species, and we're counting as many nests as we can see. Now, with the common and thick-billed murres, they don't actually build a nest bowl. They're just nesting on a ledge. So you're really looking for that bird posture to tell you if there's a nest there. It's, again, it's quite, quite tedious. Uh, this is zoomed in again even more in that same location so that buttress is just kind of over here it's actually right here and uh, looking at one of those ledges so this bird is laying uh, flat and it could either be resting or it could potentially be on an egg uh, and that's the kind of stuff that we're looking for are they just standing around or do they seem hunkered down like they might be incubating an egg this bird right here is definitely incubating an egg. It's kind of hunkered down on the rock and you can see this little black projection. Its wing is slightly out, almost like it has a broken wing. That is classic incubating posture for a common or thick-billed mer. This is a video of the colony. I'm hoping that you're gonna be able to hear the sound. It's very windy, but I thought it would give you a good idea of how frustrating it can be to count because there's so much activity going on and it just takes a bald eagle or a raven to fly overhead for all the birds to leave to kind of flush off the cliff. Uh, and then you have to wait till they come back in and then start your count over again. So you're trying to be very efficient and thorough at the same time. So here's a little video real fast. So you were mostly hearing uh, kitty wakes there and seeing kitty wakes flying in and out. Now, especially when they're incubating eggs, the, the, the mates uh, take turns with uh, food runs, basically. And uh, once the eggs hatch, they take turns with chick meal delivery. So there's a lot of birds kind of swapping in and out, and it's very difficult to keep track. Uh, because of that, we know that there's going to be some, you know, errors. There's just birds moving around. And so, again, that's another reason that the trend data is so important because it kind of takes into account all of the, um, the errors, like maybe the birds were out foraging and so you didn't see the pair there when you were counting. All right, so that's kind of the overall population counts, just uh, population and nest counts. Then there's nest monitoring. You can see me here at an observation point. Uh, my ropes are out of view, but I am on, on ropes. There's you know little micro cracks along all these edges, and so we're never allowed to go out to a cliff edge if we're not on ropes. And I'm looking at a plot here and a plot here, and I'm counting cormorant nests. Now, most of them were located here and here, but this is the kind of distance we have from the plots that we're observing. So again, it just takes a long time. You have to be very patient and you have to just wait and see what you can see. You're not just counting the nest, but you need to see what's in the nest. So this is kind of what that looks like. I told you that we uh, map our nest data. So we photograph the plots and upload that through ArcMap. So it's all ortho rectified and geo referenced. And then we assign numbers and color codes to each of our nests. And those numbers are just the number of nests that we're tracking. And the color code has to do with the species. Um, and the, those color codes were established over 20 years ago now. Um, so each of these is a nest that we're, we're actively monitoring, which means that we need to be able to see in the nest. And again, if it's a myrrh, that's really hard to tell. So you have to just see if the bird is incubating an incubating posture each day. Um, and then this is kind of looking up close. So we have a really powerful spotting scope for each of us when we're out there. We kind of divide and conquer this workload. We try to work near each other for safety because there's a lot of bears out on the site and because of potential you know, um, landslides. If you're on ropes, uh, that's great, but you still might need some help. So we try to work near each other and divide up the work. And we have to sit there and we have to look into each of these nests. And so that can take quite a bit of time. Um, you have to wait until the birds move uh, and, and so you can see what's inside. You don't want to just say that you have a bird on a nest. You want to be able to say you had one egg, two eggs, three eggs, or ultimately those, those eggs have hatched and you can see chicks. So this is looking at some black-legged kittiwakes and pelagic cormorant nests. This is uh, one of the more crowded colonies that we were able to get pretty close to. And uh, I wanted to point out some things here for you. So here's the black-legged kittiwake, and you can see at least two chicks in that nest bowl. So that's the kind of thing that we're looking for. There's two, maybe even a third chick 
uh, very likely a third chick right over there in this nest bowl. And so you want to be able to kind of wait until the adults move and you can see in. Uh, another thing I wanted to point out was some more incubating posture. This is a common mur here. You can see that it's really low and its neck is tucked in and it has that wing out to the side like it looks a little broken. That means that it's incubating. This mur right here is, is also incubating and likely this one as well. Um, but you can never guess. You have to wait and just be sure. And again, we're looking for nest, nest content. And just another look at some of our nests. You can really tell when they're hunkered down and they're incubating and getting close to hatching because all the birds will just be covered on, with bird poop from the birds above them. It's an indication that they're not really leaving. This is looking at a, a pelagic cormorant nest that finally hatched and you can see about six chicks here. And from a distance, they just look like these little black worm, worms kind of wiggling around begging for food all the time. But when you can get your spotting scope nice and zoomed in, you can actually see that they have uh, bills and bodies and little baby wings that are starting to form. So this is a pelagic cormorant nest that was successful. Uh, sometimes you all of a sudden just find that there's nothing going on with your myrrh eggs. Now we thought that these were hatching, but likely what had happened is they got crushed by something. And so this was a failed nest attempt. But if you're lucky, you end up seeing lots of chicks and eventually those chicks, you get to watch them fledge, which is pretty amazing to see this little tiny baby bird jump, you know, hundreds of feet down into the, to the ocean. This is a common myrrh here, again, that kind of brownish black and you, you don't see that real distinguishing white line along the bill. And this is a common myrrh chick. Again, this is that incubating posture for the wing. You can see the bird is kind of down and the wing is out. So it's either down because it's keeping this bird warm or there could be another egg or um, another chick underneath this common myrrh. That's a great, great sign of incubating posture. And here's another uh, video of the bird colony. That's a myrrh. So you were hearing kitty wakes doing most of that kind of high pitched honking and then the murs were that in the background. They kind of sound like grumpy old goats or whiny whiny children. They're kind of always just in the background and the kitty wakes usually squeak pretty high. The cormorants were very, very quiet. They didn't tend to make a lot of noise at all. So uh, again, back to the trend data, we're looking at fluctuations over time and there can be natural variation due to cliff slides, shift in predators or upwelling events. Certainly there's fluctuations over time uh, with changes in the climate versus uh, like La Nina versus El Nino events. But what we're seeing by and large and all the projects that I've been involved in in Alaska and, and talking to my colleagues who live up there and, and work full time with seabirds, there's a really steep decline in seabird populations um, <clears throat> along the Pacific coast, not just in Alaska, but Alaska is getting hit really, really hard. Um, the breeding season starts earlier and earlier each year. I used to go up to Alaska, at, you know, at the end of June or beginning of July to do this work, and now I have to go up in May. And that's just a sign that it's getting warmer sooner and the ice is melting sooner, um, and so the birds are, are breeding sooner. Uh, we're seeing increased ocean temperatures, a decrease in prey, and, and changes in ocean currents that affect the upwelling events. So there's a steep decline, and, and it doesn't seem to be getting better. In fact, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but to, to be honest about this data, the first year that I went out, we had barely any days off, and we were struggling to can't do all the counts on time. Uh, and the last year that I went out, so I went out three times over four years. The last year that I went out, uh, we had all of our counts done and our nest searches done and counts done in one day. Um, and so we would do a day and take a day off and do a day and take a day off. I mean, there was barely any birds to be had out there. It was actually really depressing. Um, you know, we did a lot more exploring and hiking 
Um, we paddled across to the sand spit and hiked around. We hiked to the Slug River. I mean, we did a lot more exploring, but it was actually really sad because it, it, we only had all that free time because there was no birds left on, on the colonies, which was, was really kind of, it, it was really eye-opening to see that kind of change in, in a four-year period. Um, some of the impacts to seabirds that we are expected to document when we're out there are disturbance events, and I'll show you an example of one. There's chance like a big wave comes up during a storm. We saw this a couple times and it, you know, washed away some mer eggs. It was just so sad because they're really close to hatching. Um, there's some localized uh, impacts like changes in topography from rockfall or landslides. Um, subsistence hunting and egging is allowed and it's important. But, um, you know, they definitely can disturb birds on the colony and, and they're definitely taking eggs. And then there's predation from ravens and fox um, and, you know, long term impacts like climate change. Now, obviously, we're not documenting climate change impacts directly, but the fourth year, uh, the third year we were out there, which was the fourth year that I was involved with this project. Um, you know, I took out all this wintry stuff because it's usually cold and rainy and there's some snow still on the ground uh, that's feeding the springs that we're getting our water from. And uh, that was not the case. I mean, we were hot and in sandals that entire time. And so, you know, we do take daily uh, weather readings like wind and relative humidity and temperature. And so we are actually taking climate data when we're out there and there's a weather station um, that's that's operational most of the year on the cabin. So here's an example of disturbance. I'm, I'm on a rope going down to an observation point and you can see this boat in the water behind me. Now they couldn't get south around the Cape. They, they were out of Dillingham. They were fishing in Bristol Bay, fishing for salmon. They were loaded down. And uh, they just because of the weather, they couldn't get around the Cape. They were protected on, on this side, the north side of the Cape. And every day they would try to get out around the Cape. They would tuck tail and come back in. Now they were there for over a week and they're in a cove that has plots of ours on either side. Now they needed to stay there. That wasn't, that wasn't necessarily an issue, but they were blaring their radio and they were like laughing and smoking and and uh, just kind of causing noise disturbance in the area. And we noticed a change in our um, population data for sure the week or so that they were there. So there can be random disturbance events like that from visitors. Again, chance or slippage. So this egg was really close to hatching and it fell off the cliffs. Uh, a bald eagle came over and all the birds scattered and a bunch of eggs tumbled down to the seaweed below. Um, ravens will will hunt the eggs and they'll cache them for later. So this is we actually watched this raven cache an egg and we went and found it, so we could document the raven cache or raven predation on them or eggs. Um, there's obviously natural predation. So uh, this family of fox had eight pups this year, um, and you can see there's a baby bird of some kind in its mouth, and so uh, they're definitely out hunting on the colonies as much as they can. And that's pretty much it for the impacts. Um, before I get into the general wildlife and plant photos, I was wondering if there was any questions about the project. It's a really straightforward project. Um, there's, you know, really just straightforward counting, counting nests and eggs and chicks and birds. Um, but if you have any questions, I can take those now. Okay. Um, I will get into a little bit of the wildlife. So this is just a bunch of pretty photos of animals and plants uh, because I thought you would enjoy seeing them. So obviously this is a tufted puffin and this is uh, from our observation point. So this project used to include a lot of the puffin data, but most of those plots had eroded away over the years or they were on the other Cape, Cape Newenham. And, and that was again, downsized from this project. And so uh, we weren't actually counting puffins, uh, which is too bad because they're so fun to watch. Uh, there's a lot of insects out there. Uh, they kind of all come at once. Uh, there's a ton of mosquitoes. There's all kinds of butterflies and moths. There's um, bee mimics. Uh, there are a, a handful of bees, uh, but most commonly there was this Arctic tiger moth and, and it was the most, um, it behaved the most so I could get a picture of it. Beautiful Arctic tiger moth. There's sand lance everywhere. 
Uh, so one day we were coming back, it was really cold and foggy and we noticed a ton of birds on the beach. I think I might have a video of it, extremely windy day and we couldn't figure out why they were all uh, so clustered along the shore. And we went down later and we saw that there was a ton of sand lance like this. So the gray whales go in to feed on the sand lance and the birds go in to feed on the sand lance. When they get stranded during a low tide, there's just all these fish sticking half out of their holes and they, they make for easy pickings. So here's a video, it's really windy um, and loud. But towards the end of the video, you can see all the birds on the shore and they're foraging on the sand lands. We'll be in the lower right here pretty soon. See all those birds? They're all foraging on sand lands. We actually foraged on some sand lands as well. All right, so there was the swallows. Um, there were some violet green swallows that kind of hung out in the mud area near our, near our cabin. Lots of eiders and harlequin ducks. I mean, no shortage of supply of the waterfowl. Uh, really amazing sea ducks. Oyster catchers, for sure. I see that that's your logo, so I wanted to include him or her. Um, herring gulls and kitty wakes, you can see them here feeding on a bunch of sand lance. Tufted puffins, uh, horn puffins, bald eagles. There were some bald eagles nesting on the Cape, like at the center of the Cape above one of our biggest colonies. So every time one of those eagles went out to forage, it was just chaos for us. Sandhill cranes breed there, um, and we saw them all the time around the cabin and their chicks as well. We actually stumbled upon these chicks. We didn't see the adults anywhere nearby. I mean, look at that little butterball, it's so funny. Such a cute little thing. Long-tailed ducks um, and lots of ducklings, especially towards the end of the season, we see lots and lots of ducklings running around. All kinds of waterfowl. There's tons of loons out there, uh, common loons, and this was an Arctic loon. Uh, golden plovers, uh, all kinds of shorebirds. I mean, there's just so many birds out there, it's kind of ridiculous. Marmots, this is, uh, there's quite a few marmots. The first time I heard one, it sounds like a safety whistle and they signal to each other and they're on almost every rocky point. And so, you know, maybe four or five times a day when we're on our hike, we hear these marmots signaling as we're passing by and they're signaling to other marmots. And they are frisky and after a while they get used to you and they kind of start coming out. You can see this one got really close to us. This little green mush is from it eating has teeth much like a beaver. They continue to grow like a beaver and they're herbivores. They're chewing on all that Arctic grass. Um, there's caribou. You can see these caribou are right, um, right above our cabin, uh, all molting, which is pretty neat. Here's a caribou. On one of our days off, we were on a long hike and we came across this one caribou. I thought I'd show you a little video. See that it's always windy out there. Look at that rock he's carrying. Really impressive. And he kept doing this. He would he would jog a little, and we'd, we'd go in opposite directions, and he'd stop and stare us down. It was really interesting. Red fox. I think I showed you a picture before with a bird in its mouth. Um, this was right when we got there at the beginning of the season. You can see it's molting. This um, it's winter coat. It's still got some of that winter fur on its uh, hindquarters and it's all summer in the front, winter in the back, so it's molting. And there's very rare, but there are Arctic fox there. We only saw a couple. It's mostly red fox. We didn't actually see the wolves. Uh, this was a few weeks before we arrived, our first season. This is from a wildlife camera, but there are wolves out there. We did, we did see one wolf that came through about an hour after some juvenile caribou came through looking really spooked and they actually swam across the bay. And so it was, they were likely being hunted by uh, the wolf we saw, but it was really far out at a distance and we weren't able to photograph it. So I stuck this one in for you. And then of course there's brown bears there, lots and lots of brown bears. In fact, all the trails that we use are actually brown bear trails. And so so uh, we see sign of them all the time. This is looking at one of their uh, prints up close next to my partner's hand. Uh, and we encountered them regularly. So uh, walrus tend to do this thing called stampeding there. There's so many that come into the beaches to haul out that they get pushed and pushed farther up the slopes. And eventually there's you know, thousands of walrus on these 300 foot, 400 foot tall cliffs. And if there's any kind of disturbance 
that happens at all, like a tourist plane flying overhead, they get so freaked out and they just start, you know, running, well, running for a walrus. They start moving really quickly and uh, a lot of them go off the cliffs. And that had happened a few years before my first stint out there. So there was a lot of walrus carcasses around. So there was a lot of bears around. This was a mama and her three cubs. Uh, this bear we saw as we were hiking back down after a really long day, look at it just playing in the grass there and it's so camouflaged. So you just have to go really slow and you have to make sure that the bears can always see you and hear you. They encourage you to talk while you're hiking um, and to kind of stay talking throughout the day to make uh, occasional noise so that the bears can hear you, especially if you're hunkered down and hiding from the seabirds because uh, you want them to settle down so that you can count. Um, so you have to be constantly uh, making some sort of noise. So this bear probably smelled us and heard us before it saw us, but just really camouflage in the dune grass there. And when it's foggy, this is my uh, partner Mike, when it's foggy, you have to just sit and wait. So we carry shotguns because of our, the chance of bear encounters. You know, it's not forested there. So really um, we could spook them during the fog if we came down this slope or if we rounded a bend uh, with the fog, they can't hear and smell and see as well. And so when it's foggy, the protocol is you just have to try to wait out the fog, which sometimes means you're hanging out somewhere for a couple hours and you get preoccupied. So we would photograph plants. We always had a plant ID book with us. So we would botanize during those little fog breaks when we had to kind of just sit down and wait. The fog will come in very quickly. Uh, this bear and her cubs were right behind our cabin. Uh, these are two wildlife cameras that when we're out there, we also have to manage the wildlife cameras. And so you're always scanning ahead because we could have easily come down this slope and not seen this sleeping bear and we could have startled it and had an encounter on the edge of a cliff, which would have been a really unfortunate place to have a bear encounter. So you're always looking ahead before you get back on a trail and start hiking to your next destination because, you know, there's things like bears. This is a close up of that bear sleeping. You can see that huge paw. It's almost as big as its head. Uh, and they will do that. They will just find some steep slope and they will just carve out a place to sleep like this bear did. I mean, this was a very, very steep slope. I think you can get that from the photo and it just decided it needed to take a nap there and there wasn't a suitable spot, so it made one. Uh, and they will often revisit these little uh, beds that they make. Here's just a quick little video of a mom and her cubs out by our cabin foraging on grass. Um, they are omnivores for sure, but they, but they do eat a lot of vegetation, a lot of berries, a lot of grass, a lot of sedges and rushes. This is a common occurrence for us. And we did whatever we could to stay on schedule and not disturb the wildlife. All right. Um, we also saw gray whales. So there's tons of whales that migrate by and, you know, it's hard to get good pictures of migrating whales. You often will just get a fluke or a, a blow um, from, from their blowhole or something like that. Um, we did have a, a mom and a young gray whale wash up on the beach. They came in on a high tide eating those sand lance and then they got stuck. And we, we saw them as we were hiking out one day to go do our accounts. Uh, this was our last season there actually. So it was pretty warm and we were ahead of schedule and we noticed these whales. So we stopped to go check them out and we called into the refuge to see what they wanted us to do. Um, there was a mom and a baby and as you approach them, they were echolocating to each other and you could feel the vibrations in the sand below your feet. The, the baby was clearly in distress. They were both stuck. Um, we had to try to keep them covered and we had to try to keep them wet. We worked tirelessly. You can see how far out the, the, you know, the waves are in this photo. This was right after they got stranded. They must have gotten stranded that night before. Um, and um, we tried to dig around them so that there could get you know, more water under them and try to help float them. We tried to push them. But what was happening was the, the high tides were getting lower and lower for the week. And um, there was really no way to save them. So we called in you know, to our headquarters. We asked if we could uh, put them out of their misery. We asked if someone could come out and try to help us, maybe some natives from a local village. 
but everyone was really busy with salmon season and all the NOAA, NOAA folks who kind of deal with these whale strandings, there was uh, over 120 whales stranded this exact same week all through coastal Alaska and we were just a super remote site so no one could get out to us. Obviously there's no way to get heavy equipment out there. So again, we were told to try to keep the predators and scavengers off them and try to get them out to the water. And with just two of us, even moving a baby well, uh, you know, we were really hopeful in the beginning, but it proved insurmountable and there was no way to do it. So we tried to make sure that they um, were wet and, um, and covered as much as possible. And we tried to scare the predators and scavengers away, but ultimately there was really nothing that we could do. And it, um, we were told to stand down and, and let nature take its course. It's part of the life on the refuge that these things happen. Now that said, they, you know, we're seeing more and more whale strandings each year and um, they believe that it's attributed to climate change. Um, they're, they're not entirely sure. We were asked if these whales died while we were there to take skin and eye samples and uh, they didn't in fact die until um, the day that we were, or after maybe we were leaving, we uh, were flying away in the float plane and we saw the tides finally carrying them away and it seemed that they were deceased. So once we were told to stand down, we just didn't go near them at all. We didn't want to cause them any more distress or prolong um, their life in any way. But it was, you know, this really kind of gut-wrenching experience, but it was also, it's part of nature. It's beautiful and it's, it's brutal. Uh, and that's kind of life out on, on the refuge there. Uh, on a happier note, there is tons of harbor seals around and tons of Pacific walrus. Now this is before the major haul out events. So we were just seeing a handful of them come in at a time. And again, these are all males um, and they are coming in to thermoregulate. Now I didn't know this before. I thought walrus had a lot of blubber, but in fact they don't. They just have really, really thick skin. And you'll see them out on the water and they're almost gray, like an ashen gray or white. So kind of like the color of this cobble. Uh, and, and they need to come in at that point and, and warm up. And so you can kind of see them turning pink. And then the ones that have been there the longest are that nice kind of roasted brown color that we recognize walrus to be. But these walrus are all um, hauling out, just thermoregulating. They have to do that every day. So it's really important for us to make sure that we're only making enough noise to disturb the bears. And we do that in certain locations, not near the coves where the walrus haul out. Um, we had to watch burning our trash. You know, we didn't want the smoke to be going near the beaches where the walrus haul out. They had to be going away from the haul out beaches because we didn't want to keep the walrus from coming on shore and thermoregulating. So uh, kind of monitoring the walrus was also part of our job while we were out there. Uh, this I just took from a wildlife camera. You can see the cabin. This is in November, so we had already left, but it's the very beginning of the haul out season. And so, you know, there'll be thousands and thousands and thousands of walrus that, that hit this beach, and they all go up these crazy slopes, up the cliffs to where we're monitoring our seabirds because there's just not enough room on the beach. So the first walrus that get there get pushed farther and farther inland, and that's how those um, kind of catastrophic uh, events can happen where there's a stampede and they go they go off the edges of the cliffs. But this is just a little taster of how many walrus you might see haul hauling out on the beach at any given time. This is a little, little video, um, again, not the best video, but of them kind of swimming around that I thought you might enjoy. It's really windy, so it's kind of shaky. But they're trying to decide if they're going to come ashore. And it was a common sight. We would see that every day. Um, all right, we're going to end with just some uh, pretty plant pictures. This is related to a wormwood. Uh, this is a willow. The willows there grow uh, out across. They, they grow prostrate. They don't grow tall. This is, in fact, the smallest willow in the world. So cute. A violet. With the, you know, the wildflowers stand taller than the willows usually. This is a dogwood. So related to our creek and Sierra dogwood. This is related to a popcorn flower. Some of you might know as a cryptantho or plagiobothries. This is in that same family. This is related to Labrador tea, a leadum. Very pungent. Um, this right here is a, a tundra version of a blueberry and these are crowberries. And again, in the background, you can see the willow. This is called weasel snout. Um, this is a sedum. It's related to a dudlia. This is a fritillary or chocolate lily. 
this picture I happen to really love. So this is a manzanita. It's a manzanita berry on a manzanita and that's its leaves. They're really textured. And then this little thing that has the round leaves with these kind of scallop margins, this is a, a dwarf or miniature birch. And I, it ha I mean, I'm a, I'm a botany nerd. This is probably one of the most precious plants I've ever seen in my life. And it took everything in me to not collect it because I was just so in love with it. But it's a miniature birch. It's really beautiful. Um, there's a bunch of different louse warts out there. Here's a few of them. And again, they're standing taller than the willows. This is a CP. And Lamus mollus, this is a common dune grass throughout the Pacific. It actually occurs in our county as well, all the way up the coast into Alaska. And um, in some of the boggy areas, you get these um, carnivorous plants. This um, is the inflorescence of a colt's foot. These white flowers that you see, they're apetalous and uh, colt's foot's very medicinal. It's in the Asteraceae and there's just a few leaves on the ground, but very medicinal, very important plant culturally. And uh, it just the last couple beautiful scenery photos before we call it good. Um, the one thing I wanna say about this is this is as dark as it tends to get there unless there's a storm, this is midnight. Um, so the sun never really goes lower than that. You can see the clouds really accumulating over uh, Cape Newenham and this fog bank coming in. And this is what it looks like about a half hour later when that fog has really hit us and kind of blacked out our, our midnight sun, but it never really got darker than this while we were there. All right, I'm going to end the talk there. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take them now. Uh, thanks so much, Lisa. It's a really nice uh, perspective on not just uh, the, you know, the, the quantitative data of birds, but of really what it takes to get that quantitative uh, data, you know, being out among grizzly bears and seeing all these kind of, uh, you know, these kind of things that, you know, this is the whole other side of the story to field data. It's it's really nice to see. Um, I know I know from your other work in uh, St. Lawrence. You know, there's a whole other side of your um, time with the native people. But obviously, this was in a very remote area, and um, yeah. you didn't have that time to um, connect with the people there. But that that's a another story that I know you could tell. Um, yeah, I mean, I was with I, one other. Right person. now, is there any, any other questions? Any questions that Lisa, uh, for, uh, that you might have for Lisa? Lisa, this is Nikki. Do you um, have any plans to to go back out in the future? Yeah, so I'm not sure about this project. I would really love to, but since I was out there last, I've had a knee replacement, and um, I'm kind of wondering how it would, would fare out there. Additionally, this project has been really defunded, and so it's run just based on volunteers or occasionally um, from the refuge staff. And so we're not really sure if they're going to have people back out there again. Um, and you never really know the last time you're out of place could be your last time. And so I hope that I get back out there again, even if it's to just kind of teach someone uh, the lay of the land so that they can take over the project. Um, I'm not really sure, but I will be getting back to Alaska as soon as COVID is kind of handled. I don't know if it'll ever be over, but I'm involved in a handful of other projects up there. And I know that they're they're looking to gear up as soon as everyone's vaccinated and have their boosters. So probably not this summer, but the next summer. But I'm not sure if I'll ever be back at Cape Pierce again. And I have to say, it's the kind of place that I, I would never be able to, to afford to go on, on vacation. And, and uh, vacationing isn't allowed. That's a research cabin. So yeah, I really hope so someday. Any other questions about our logistics or the project itself or anything else we might have seen out there? Okay. Well, if there's no questions, then thank you. I really, really enjoyed this presentation tonight. It was, it was really fun to see, you know, what you experienced while you were out there. Um, yeah, it was great. Thank you. Yeah, my yeah, pleasure. Thanks so much, Lisa.
My Thank pleasure. You, Lisa. Really interesting. <laughs> I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. Well, hopefully I'll talk to you guys again at some point. I do have some other presentations, so I'll coordinate with Tara on those. And um, thank you for having me. Yes. Good night, Lisa. Good night. That was a good presentation. Normally, there's a lot more questions.